I'm Mark from the Farming Forum. I'm Andrew Wilson, tenant farmer from Rydale, North Yorkshire. Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, inviting me out to see you again. No problem. Um, we're uh, doing spot drilling with uh, your, your Missouri, one of your many drills. What's uh, this? We have a few, yeah. Maybe three or four? Regular uh, use? Five or six. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, right, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Perhaps it's only the three or four I've seen then so far. <laughs> six metre tine drill, three metre Missouri, three metre com Pottinger combi on discs, an old four metre Amazon combi on Suffolk, so it doesn't do a lot. Oh, and a four metre ladder set rapid. A drill for every eventuality then? Yeah, just about, yeah. Granted, three of them, if you had, it sounds glamorous, so you think that three of them, if you added their value together, what I paid for them, would come to about 11 grand. I'd, I'd have said that's quite a cost effective farming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you stick a classic Fergie in front of it, and off you go. Uh, there's nothing, I don't think there's any such thing as a classic, provided it's actually doing a job. Well, you, yeah, true enough, yeah. Is it classic or is it tight? I'm not really sure. This old beast is 20 year old this year. He's got a quote, got a quote for a new one that was a, a mortgage of a figure. I thought, <clears throat> swallowed a bit hard and thought, no, no, I don't think so. I don't, that's not, that, not nowadays. And bought this instead for a lot more than 100 grand less. Is that a farmer or Yorkshire talking or is that both? <laughs> um, I think I would tick both boxes to go. <laughs> Or a sensible business decision. I'll take that. Yeah, yeah let's go I, with that. I'll go with that. Still does the Cost same job. Isn't it? Yeah, we were, once upon a time we were buying new tractors about every other year. We were changing front line two quite regularly. But well, I'm talking 1990s. Yeah. And I now I, at this point in time, I can't see a time when we'll buy another new one, to be honest. So, what would your biggest tractor have been in, 90, in, the, in the mid 90s when you were swapping them frequently? Then? It would be uh, a 956 with a TB turbo and 125, 130 or so. That could pull a house down when it had a chocolate transmission. But you'd have paid, what, roughly for that back then? Uh, is it 1,000 hours on when it came? It would be low 20s. Very low 20s. And to replace the similar tractor now, as you said, you're going to be talking. You stick 100 on top of that, I would think. Easel. I mean, that same, that same tractor nowadays in Tidy Nick is still commanding, what, somewhere just over 10, depending on what condition it's in. Uh, A tidy one will get nearer 20. Bad really, isn't it? When you think about it, all that. Yeah, it is, because if, if you're selling them, you know, the values have gone up, but you're paying a big lump of tax man, aren't you? Yeah. If you had them for, with a 3875 first tractor I bought, bought myself, I paid eight, eight and a quarter for it, with three and a half thousand hours on when it was nine year old. It, it's 1994, so it's 30 year old now. It's got nearly 12,000 hours on it. It's coming, its value dropped about four and it's crept back up again. Well, it's worth more to keep than it used to sell. But it, it does 200 hours a year, it's still a working yeah. for it. Little tractor yeah. jobs and bits and pieces. Quite handy little tractor, really, for various different yeah. things. But there's no, there's no, incentive to change it because it's it will be make it a lot more expensive because of value that's in it yeah which it sounds like i'm complaining and i'm not it's good that its value is good but it's uh, the cynic in me thinks how much of this is just to get more tax out here really well but you know as we've, as we've said how, how much difference does it really make you're still using you're still planting a crop of wheat yep and actually, some would argue that you're, the way you're doing it is it's far more profitable. Well, scale is a funny thing in farming, isn't it? Yeah. If you get to a big scale, like take, we'll take Tatis for instance, we were, in 2017 we got to our peak with, with 328 acres that year, that's the most we've ever had. We are putting 2,000 ton into a merchant store. I should we say their, their idea of store management and mine were quite different and maybe let's leave it there. Um, but we don't do that anymore, that kind of answers its own questions. Uh, we were busy idiots really, we were stretching machinery, we were stretching people, we were working in conditions arguably we shouldn't have been, we either needed a major investment in infrastructure and build a store or we cut it back. And I gave calculators some fa fairly serious exercise and cutting it back was the, by far the best thing I ever did. So what, what are you growing this year? 150 this year. There's about there's near 160 next year, just as fields fall. But that lets us fill the store in our own farm, a store a mile away that we've rented for the last nigh on 20 years, and a few for short-term storage in a shed rather than a store. And that's the, the 
there's those few in that shed for, that go before Christmas are quite important cash flow. It would be a lot harder for us to grow 120 than it would 150. Yeah. Because that 30 acre, 500 ton November contract, it pays some bills at Christmas, doesn't it? And is that the, the, the acreage you wound it back to in yeah. 2017? Yeah, we cut it back from 330 to about 240, I think. And the following year, cut it back a bit further. Right. And the machinery doesn't wear out as much, you don't get pushes out, you don't break as much, people aren't as tired. Because things are a bit easier, it's a more pleasant job. We, I certainly enjoy it more than I did. Granted, yeah. don't, don't take this year's deals into account because they're pretty cool. Um, but it's, it is easier, it's more enjoyable. And what do we do this for? We, we spend a lot of time at work. Money's obviously part of the driver, the driver, but it's not the sole driver. There's got to be some you, satisfaction, isn't it? There is, and you, you hear these people, particularly on radio, that you know, roll on Friday and we've passed, it's Wednesday, so we've gone past hump day. What on this fine earth is that all about? If you hate your job that much, do get a different job. Yeah. Do something different, blimey Charlie. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, I, lo I love my job. I'm, doing, I'm fortunate enough to be doing what I wanted to do when I was a very small kid. Rightly or wrongly, I'm never going to get rich doing it. Um, but I do enjoy what I do, and there's a lot to be said for that. It's, uh, we keep finding ways of doing things, and farmers always have. You can take into whatever political scaremongering comes along, and there'll be... There'll be another subject next week, you know, farmers are ruining the planet with methane from cows. Let's just ignore all them aeroplanes that, when they were parked up during COVID, the sky's got cleaner. Is that a coincidence? <laughs> you know, I'm getting down cynical line again here, Mark. But no, no, you know, that, I mean... Uh, you know, farmers feed the planet. We, the, there's a lot of tourism in this country. Tourism sells on the view. Who provides the view? The farmers do. Look what happened in foot and mouth in Cumbria when the, when the fells had no livestock on them. Nobody went. Nobody went. Yeah. There's nothing to see. The, the, the view could, I mean, different. you couldn't go to Lady Shudder either, could you, at the time, I think? No, you couldn't. Um, but you, you take farming out of it, you know, you've ground all the planes in COVID, and the same livestock was still the same, the sky's cleaned up. Yeah. But yeah, farmers are convenient scapegoats, aren't we, really? It's interesting, I don't, I don't know whether you've seen it, I saw something on Twitter the other day about this new satellite that's been launched recently. It's, it's actually... Is this one of the satellites that makes it rain? If so, can no, you turn no, it off, please? This, this, is the, this is the satellite that actually can identify the, the hot spots for methane. All right. And interestingly, you know, there's quite a lot of it that's associated with oil production, for example. Well, yeah, bound to be in there. You know, so, so there's of course, a, there's it's still a, cows. There's a trade-off in there, you know. Absolutely, you, there's got to be. You, you look at regen farming and you know, everything's got a tag in them. I can't, I don't like labelling things particularly, but you know, we do a fair bit of region things of one sort or another ourselves, but if, you, if you're putting half the inputs in, but you're only getting a third of the crop, for one thing, you're, you're not going to make any brass, but are you actually doing better for, for planning while you've got that warm, fuzzy feeling that you're doing a bit of good? Arguably not. We still, people, there's more people than ever, they're all going to need to eat. There's no more land being produced and far too much of it being concreted over. There's going to come a point in there where there's yeah. a suddenly there's a, a bit of a wake up call. I'm trying not to swear that uh, oh dear, where's all the food going to come from? Let's blame the farmers for taking the easy route down the wild farm flower meadows and not producing any food. Bad farmers get some food produced. Yeah, it's, there's a lot of short sighted political thinking, and I guess a long term industry like agriculture and the short term thing like politics have never been good bedfellows. No. I don't suppose they ever will be. It's, uh, I try not to worry about what I can't control, and that's most things, really. Because if you did, you'd send yourself crackers. Yeah. It's, uh, 2019 was a really, really, really wet, tasty time. We got rained off lifting again. I was faced with overwintering 50 odd acre for the second time in three years. And one of our casuals said to me one day, well, when we rained off, we were just watching rain run down your yard. He says, how come we never see you shouting and swearing and leaping up and down when it does this? So you get a bit stressed with it all. I said, will men like shouting and screaming and leaping up and down and effing and jeffing make it stop raining? <laughs> um, well, no. I said, will it make you like work any harder? I don't suppose so, no. I said, what's the point then? I said, the thing that gives me a sense of humour fairly is that the stuff we can control, you know, if that harvester, for instance, has had a rattle and a squeak and it's been limping along a bit and we've got rained off and nobody's fixed it and nobody's told me it needs fixing, and then we get a short window to get back on again and it breaks in the first five yards and that breakage could have been avoided by sorting yeah. out when it was raining, I might just have a sense of humour failure. 
uh, worry about the things you can control, not the things that you can't. I mean, that's, I ain't got all the answers far from it, but if I worried about everything that I could worry about, I'd be a dribbling wrecking corner. You know, it's, uh, yeah, there's no, um, what do you say? There's a, there's a phrase that's, that's far too often used, future-proof your business. Hang on a minute. Let's just back the truck up a little bit. Look at the last five years. Who on this fine earth could possibly have predicted the last five years? Well, yeah. Absolutely nobody. nobody. No. And that's not just, you know, that's not just farming. No, no, it's everything. You know, you're trying to future-proof farm, your, your farming business when you're absolutely exposed to the elements to start with. Yeah. It's pretty not impossible, isn't it? It is, yeah. Future-proofing is a sales tactic. Yeah. You know, those that tell you to future-proof your business are generally trying to sell you something. Yeah. Yeah, I'm probably not as easy to sell to as I once was because I ain't got the same buying power as I once used to have. And maybe you're a little bit more cynical than that. The uh, old old. <laughs> it's a funny thing he's 40. I'm not that far off 50 and to tell me it gets worse. But, well, I'm probably is right. I've been 50, I've always been cynical, but I've been 50 for the last few months. So it doesn't make that much difference. <laughs> not to my cynicism anyway. You'd already got used to it when you yeah, before, before the big dick, yeah. yeah. So, with your choice of drills in this Missouri, I mean, mm. you touched on Reed yet, did you, you bought the Missouri because of the, the sort of get, doing a bit of direct drilling? Or, um, or no, the reasoning? what tipped the balance of buying a new Missouri, I have to confess, was the grant, but that wasn't the reason for buying it. It just made the difference between buying a new one and a second hand one, basically. We had a, now I bought it from somebody on the forum, who I don't know if I should name or I shouldn't, um, and a, a nice man with a very nice farm. Um, it was upgrading. He had it for a few years. He bought this Cochrane AT300. Uh, right. uh, a big raving thing compared to this, really. Yeah. Tra trail drill and there's seven quarters, 17 inches yeah. wide in three meters to drill beans because we were we were spinning. We'd been on the wheat barley rate route and followed the fashion. I'm not a fashion fashion follower, as you can tell. Um, it didn't go well. We had some poor barley before the rape. Rape was getting ravaged by slugs and pigeons. Flea beetle weren't really a thing back then. Um, but I'm not a shooting man. We had a lot of taties back then. 30 acre rape and 300 acre taties. The rape was getting ignored and it, they were very poor. Then the, the wheat was half decent, but it was ravaged by slugs. And it, and it wasn't very fun, very much fun. It was quite expensive farming. It didn't make a load of money and it, I wasn't enjoying it. Something had to change. So we were spinning beans on with a first spin out back of a Ford 5.6 and I was trying to plow them in just like a couple of tram lines at a time then I was trying to plow them in while everybody else was lifting taties when it was arguably too wet and it was too wet, too wet and too stiff a ground to do anything as far as levelling goes so it was getting left and at that point I was driving the combine and the sprayer so I was getting all the rough rides <laughs> if I was drilling them and doing all the rough riding I would in control of my own destiny to a point, do something about it yeah. for crying out loud. We thought about putting a drill hopper on top of a shaker eight uh, and going down that route, but we used shaker eight quite a lot for other things back then. Still do really, but we've got different legs in now. Um, I didn't really fancy that idea. So I had a look about on, on the internet, you know, look at a few classifiers, you put a lot of them out on cost because we had a big area to put this drill over. And initially I bought the Cochrane with it, jointly with a friend of mine whose circumstances changed um, so we finished up with being the sole owner of it which my father was a little bit eye rolling and what the hell have you bought that for and what's wrong with spinning them on and plowing them in well he wasn't the one having the rough ride was he yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the, we drilled a few a few cover coats with Cochrane which was all right but it was too much for what we're trying to do with it really um, it took quite a lot of horsepower, and for beans it was brilliant, it really was. It revolutionised bean growing, really, for us. Because you was, you were, we had a time bar on front on the track to link his trail and it behind us. And we had some much better bean crops, fields in better nick. When, it's really frustrating if you're ploughing beans in, and the bean between the furrows is the one that you're trying to combine, and the pods are lower than the top of the soil, you can't harvest it. Yeah. You've spent all that effort growing it. Yeah, can't and, get the crop off. And then you can't harvest it. You know, what the hell's going on here? You finish up with your, your following crop, you've got volunteer beans in the same rows as, as your furrows. We're still turning. Here we're trying mining, that's why it's easier. And so it, it changed all that. And it, that we, we dabbled a little bit, we tried a bit of spring barley quite unsuccessfully. Uh, 
we tried wheat after beans and it's a bit of a you know, one size fits all has never worked. Plough press combridule was the way back in the 90s and that we did that because that's all we had. And that wasn't the answer in a lot of years. We had a, a contractor came and drilled us some with a, a claydon that went quite well. In, in, in principle of it, and he actually came back the following year and drilled some, he's a, he's a foreign member as well. And he, he came back the following year and drilled some wheat with the same drill. And we like, let's have a look at this strip till thing. It, it might be for us because it's not, it's not a hardcore direct drilling like in the 70s with the good old Bettys and DDs. Yeah. Um, we didn't, we are taking straw off for pigs and things. We didn't really have the land for that. But the leading tine appealed, well, the, the Claydon doesn't follow ground contours as, as well as this does. Um, and various different reasons. I didn't really think it was the drill for us, but we'd had a go at it and the principle of strip till appealed. Uh, and that was sort of sat at the back of my mind for a bit and we'd had a go over at Cockley and we didn't have enough acres to justify buying anything of any substance, really. It had to, it had to be project corner money or not much more. Project corner money is normally a thousand quid. Cochrane <laughs> costs us a bit more than that. Um, but I was still looking in sort of four or five grand mark, and at that point they're, they're either not capable of dealing with a strong land or they're knackered. Yeah. Um, but softly, softly catching monkeys, the saying goes. The Cochrane served as well. We're doing more and more with it, and I thought, well, we need to look at upgrading this, but what do we upgrade it for? What is going to give us the constant depth? Because that Cochrane was fantastic in depth control. Depth control and, and handling trash, it was amazing at. Yes, it, it tested your pony on the front if it was a bit greasy. And was that doing more and more of the drilling out? Really? Yeah, it was, yeah. Do, yeah. Yeah, not massive amounts more. We were, what did we use for putting oats in after a year or two? It was a disc drill. We had a four metre Bettison for a year or two. I soon got sick of end, end wheel drills <laughs> with a lot of little fields and, oh dear me, we went with a, with a rigid turkey topper and a rigid tiller as well actually, but a drill, yes, we were spending more hours moving the blooming thing than we were drilling with it. Yeah. For all you could pull it with 3075 quite easily, and there was nothing really wrong with having put seed in the ground, the hassle factor was immense, and parts weren't that plentiful. So that went, and we got an eight metre tine drill, me getting all giddy, thinking that we'll be able to get like three drill breeds per tram line instead of eight or six with chase at four metre betty sublime we're gonna have this drilled in no time flat. <laughs> Two wet years and, and no. it was a tithe. Tithe tithe right, drill. Yeah. Plumbing big old trail thing we felt like yeah. prairie farmers with that thing. Got a big hopper on it. Yeah 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 we could get a season's worth of seed in hopper if we wanted to. <laughs> it was enormous. <laughs> like driving up field with a sprayer but you were drilling. But, it's not uh, ideal when it's wet in the back end though. No, <laughs> um, we're only using it for cover crops really and it was a giant rake. It was like a stubble rake that didn't let go of trash. It was good at, good at making big heaps. Yeah. Well, you know, there was a bit of chatter and we thought, well, let's give it a go. And we didn't pay a fortune for it, thank goodness for that. Um, it, it went it two seasons and lad driving it had really got sick of it by that point. We got a mow drill on, a, that was on a grant, on a capital, capital CP something grant scheme. I mean, my rationale was you could buy a mid 90s mow drill for eight or nine grand and need to spend three on it. Uh, Bettison was worth about 1500 quid and if I put the grant, which was nine and a bit, I think if I remember right, to it as well, I was getting very close to value of a new mower. I mean, you can make a figure tell what you want to say yeah, and I'm as guilty yeah. as that as next man. Um, so mower came with a good job of putting its seed in ground, but they don't take a lot of pulling, they take more lifting than they do pulling. 200 horsepower tractor with auto steer because there was no markers on it. It seemed a bit expensive for a little three metre drill, drilling cover crops. Set up it wasn't that big and it was just taking too long. Combine driver was trying to do it before he went combining. We're not that flush with men on the ground at some certain times of the year with bailing straw and stuff like that. So we're, we're fairly independent, we do just about everything ourselves. It's, uh, it became inadequate really for what we're trying to achieve because we'd, we'd gone from drilling a few cover crops in front of Tate's. The first cover crop was drilled 2011. So it's not a recent phenomenon, it's a constantly tweaking phenomenon. I'll say that we haven't got all the answers by a long stretch. Um, but I've learned a little bit about what not to do. And you, do you think the cover crops in front of Tate's has helped the job? Definitely. 
without without any doubt, we've got. Oh, and what benefits do you think it gives you? Uh, le with less PCM. Um, we've, we've for a while we were putting mustard in cover crops, which was giving us free living nematode in return, which was took us seven years to learn that one. <laughs> um, put us on back foot a little bit. You know, you don't learn it all in one uh, built in a day, as the saying goes. Um, but with the soil's healthier, if you, in very simple terms, we, we've been using nematicides before, which is a soil fumigant basically. And soil fumigants kill all the life in the soil, the good and the bad. Well, invariably the bad stuff comes back quicker than the good. Yeah. And you know, my, my thinking has become that if you strengthen the good, it will overpower the bad. If you try to remove it all, the bad will come back and all you'll have left will be the bad. So you've actually gone backwards. Uh, the, the cover crop is helping the general soil health. It's not necessarily about killing the PCN. It's about it reinforcing the good stuff. Uh, your mixtures have varied quite a bit over years, um, but we've gone from a little bit of mustard before potatoes to the cover crop before every potato crop, uh, before sugar bee, before spring oats, and if we occasionally we grow spring beans, which is basically a wet year, then we'll put it before spring beans if we have the opportunity. Right. Spring, spring barley often follow sugar beet, so we can't, that's the only spring crop we can't really accommodate it is anything that follows beet, because if beet's lifted in March, sometimes we're drilling it in the same week, so there isn't time. Yeah. That's worked well, but the, the key to the cover crop is, is don't spend too much on it. You know, spending more on seed doesn't give, necessarily give you a better, co better cover crop, it just gives you an emptier wallet. <laughs> Direct drill it if you can. There are there are odd occasions. This year being one of them where we've we're, we know there's a field with a weed problem or a lot of volunteers going to be an issue. We'll try and give it. If it's after winter barley, we might give it a scratch. This year it didn't rain, did it? No. So all the volunteers came up in cover crop because we disturbed it. Damn. It's an opposite effect to what we wanted it to have. I don't think you're on your own in that. Oh day. no. <laughs> no, I haven't got a good cover crop because I'm all this time. <laughs> We spend seven or eight grand on cover crops in a year with seed and drilling. Do you do your own mix? Yep. Or, yeah. Yeah, because I'm far too tight to buy a ready mix. <laughs> Wanky, no, I'm, I'm too, far too fussy and, I, and I'm, I'm far too tight to buy a ready mix seed. So we, we buy straights and I, we have a, a one ton feed mixer, good old York machinery sales special. Um, <laughs> that you chuck it all in and it mixes it all up and it comes out all, in, all nicely mixed up for you. It, it's, Less faff than you think it might be. It does make a good job of mixing it up, to be fair. But I suppose you, you've learned what works on your land and what suits your. Yeah. Uh, you know, over the 11 years, you've been oh, yeah. planting cover crops and playing with it and modifying the mixes and. Playing with it, and we've been talking to me now. <laughs> <laughs> but you probably, you probably couldn't go and buy the mixes off the shelf that are to suit exactly what you want. Oh, no, no. But almost certainly not. I'm sure there'll be companies out there will mix me a bespoke mix if I want them to. That's a cost. That's a cost obviously, yeah. yeah. But we're, I, we use your notes, we occasionally use black oats, if we've got a, a higher PCN county in a field I might, I might feel generous enough to put black oats in but usually it's also oats, farm saved oats of hurry, uh, oil radish, uh, there's various different varieties of oil radish and we've tried quite a few of them and most of them only, only last one year. And there is one variety out there that's been in now for five years, I think, that causes him to consistently perform. So that stays. If it works, it stays. If it doesn't, it goes. And is it, if the cover crops before potatoes allowed you to cut any, obviously there's, there's, there's some economic benefit to your inputs, but is it allowed you to cut any part of the operation out in so much as Yeah, we, we used to bed till about 150, we go back to the late 90s, early 2000s, we were bed tilling all of it once. We were ridging up with a rigid tiller and doing half of it again, wow. which wasn't very rainproof and blinking expensive. Yeah. And I, in 2013, we hosted quite a lot of trials, and at that point, we just got this, we hadn't done rigid tiller more than a couple of years, and it replaced two air tractors with two single tillers and a, a big tractor on a, on, with auto steer on, on ridges, and we put big tiller on this ridging tractor. And I thought we'd made that much saving, we'd never make a change as big ever again. Well, my long sighted glasses were obviously not working, <laughs> were they? Because at that point I thought we'd made so much change, we'd never make as much change ever again. Well, I've changed a hell of a lot more in 10 years since then. <laughs> it makes me quite excited about the future. What else can we change? It's, uh, so we've, we've been till in about a quarter, between a quarter and a third. It depends on, on soil type. And you're ploughing everything 
you plow, still plowing everything? Just about you? plowing everything, yeah. If, it, if it's really late, we might not plow it, but... You're just going straight in with the ridges? Uh, no, we'll, we're, uh, we're quite simple thinkers, really. In that the easiest way to move less soil is less depth. Yep. If you're, if you're planting something like a potato in a row, that uh, you need, you've got your tater rows like that, your de-stoner's going the same because we've got a fair bit of stone to go with. We, can't, we haven't found a way of avoiding de-stoning yet. Following how I was lifting myself. So we, we, in most cases we have to de-stone. We're not really kitted up yet for not de-stoning. Your, share, your de stone shares going long. Well, if you've got legs that aren't moving everything the full width, all that clod's going straight up your de stone. Yeah. Slows the job down too much. The first thing you reach for is bed tiller. Yeah. Well, bed tiller's milling all soil down fine, which already gets it through de stone and gets your taties planted, but you've chopped your worms into tiny little bits and, and milled up all your organic matter. Well, the physical organic matter of the cover crop I want in the planted row because that, that it keeps the, the, improves the real porosity and the rows don't cap and crack and slump like they used to do and if they're not cracking we're not getting light into them taties that are costing a fortune to grow so stock feeds dropped from uh, it was about near enough as it makes a difference a ton, a ton to acre in stock feed at one point peak wow. we got it down to about half a ton to acre with a bit of, a bit of a different grading strategy but it was still a lot mm -hmm. 150 ton of spud was going for stock feed out out of 300 total at 20 quid a ton for stock feed instead of contract price was a serious lump of money. Yeah, yeah. Well, now we've been. We've, if you've had that, that's a yeah. massive step forward. Well, now we've got about instead of instead of a ton, we've, instead of half a ton, we've got it down to less than 100 kilos. Wow. Which is progress in the right direction, yeah. at least. You tell where the phone signal is. That's not the other end of the field, is it? At the top of the field. So we're, uh, we've reduced stock feed, that helps saleable spuds, it helps tuber quality because you haven't got bits of green putting your defect counts up and things like that. It's easier to harvest, one well, at men came back and says, uh, I've just clocked harvest of each share in ground at 11.5k. He says, I've, I've had to tell him to slow down. I says, no, you just concentrate on keeping up, not leave harvester driving to harvester driver. <laughs> because it, it doesn't take as much separating because that, even, that, even after monumental amounts of rain, yeah, it is slowing us down a bit this year. Um, but it, it, se it separates easier on harvester because it hasn't set. Even though the, if the huge amounts of rain we've had, it hasn't all run together. Yeah. There's yeah. odd fields where it's not quite so clever. Generally, they're the ones that we've been tilled. So it's we've re cutting out that cultivation. Plowing's easier. We've, we've for years and years, like everybody else, really, we had Bumford Superflows. 1970s technology that were never designed for ripping tater land up even then. No. There were stubble cultivators by design. And we were back then we were ploughing it in, in autumn, usually after we finished harvesting when it was too wet. Um, and then mauling it about with a super floor trying to get it to dry and sometimes we'd plough it again. Uh, and then bed tilling it to death. It was quite unsatisfying really. Whereas now we'll work it sort of just in time. We've got a Simba TL cultivator, which is basically a horse tyrannal painted yellow. With twisted shins on it, and it sort of turns the soil over and mixes it up quite well. Well, very well. We capped to bits with it, really. Um, so much so that we had to buy a, a, an imported equivalent because if one driver has got a super flow, one's got a Simba TL, they're going to fall out. <laughs> they're all going to go for TL every time. And the super flow was knackered, so we bought a Zagroda, I think it is, for quite a lot less money than Simba was, but it's, uh, it wears the same metal, it does a very similar job. Right. We go through the cover crop with it, with that first, we top cover crop with a, with a five metre back wing topper, because in most cases, hopefully it's this big, it won't be an issue this year, will it? Topper's not going to get much exercise next spring. <laughs> That'd be past Leicester have to do. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, Some costs over there, uh, yeah. looking positive. Well, yeah, you're going to have to look for getting binoculars out to find positives out of that one, Mark. Especially if you're looking for a return on a cover crop this year. No, well, yeah. I know the important stuff happens underground, but, you know, there is a limit. Even my optimism gets stretched at times. <laughs> We've, uh, we pull the, the, the TL through after it's been topped, primarily to mix in the organic matter, whether that be muck, cover crop or both, maybe seven or eight inches deep. Well, we can do that with a 
150 horsepower, 64, 80 on a three meter Polish equivalent to a TL, uh, which is generally the tool, for, that's where that one slots in really. And that's for various reasons, the TL's slightly better to, uh, to reach behind. And from an operator point of view, it, it fits better to do it that way. Um, usually then we'll plow it. We have a seven for a wagon plow that entertains people where I take it to plowing matches with 170 horsepower on it with no weights on and all those cool kids with their 300 horsepower green and shiny with a two ton box on front with their name on and a few LEDs and stuff super trendy five furrows on back 300 <laughs> ponies five furrows and I rock up with seven furrows on 170 with no weights on and one comment here before last when I took it was that is not going to pull that oh yes it is oh no it ain't I had an audience when I first set seven furrows in, and it's got a bark a bit like 7490 I took. It's, it's been to the moon and back on our <laughs> clock, but it still barks like this one does. Well, he was a spectator spot watching Wilson, waiting for Wilson to make a mess of his plowing. I didn't win, but you know, it was good fun. We don't plow corners, we don't plant corners or tater fields, so why bother plowing them? No, so right, yeah. seven for a wagon plow, because it's dragged in front, it's easy enough to pull it. Yeah. We're plowing at 10 inch deep, whereas back in the day we're at 12, 13, which makes a difference to you know, get your calculator out and work out how many percent that is. It's, it, it's quite a lump yeah, less soil yeah, that we're moving. Yeah. You're moving less soil, wearing less metal out, burning exactly. less diesel. Yeah, burning less diesel, and we're not diluting the organic matter quite as much because it's mixed into less soil. And we're making use of it rather than bury it. We've spent all this money growing the blooming things. What do we want to bury it in a, an anaerobic layer in the bottom of the furrow do It's not going to do me any good, any no. good down there. So it's, that's, it's all pieced together quite well. And in a lot of cases, we can pull TL through after plow and then ridge it up. The four, four ridging bodies fold up ridges on uh, 7720 usually, ridges up. And you, I, get, I get a few comments that tractor is nothing like big enough for pulling for four ridging bodies. Well, when I was a student, my old gaffer back then used to ridge up before Christmas. And he had a two bodied ridger on a 3070s massy sprayer tractor on 13.638s. So I think I can pull twice as many bodies with twice as much horsepower, really. Yeah. We, have, we haven't got any stupid, stupid size hills, but we're not trying to ridge it up at Australia type depths. No. So it's not pulling tractor about like it would if we were a lot deeper. We're only working to ice at top of board. You see some folks ridging up and soils coming over top of board. Well, it's going straight into wheeling bottom. What, you've just cultivated all that soil and then you're running over it again. It doesn't seem to make sense in my head. Maybe I'm just tight. Well, no, I've, <laughs> you know, like you say, we've all seen it, haven't we? The ridging bodies in that deep, it's the, I mean, the frames on the, on the top of the plowing. Yeah, you're leveling up in frame. Yeah. But we're, we, we're quite patriotic with our machinery choices in British drill. Most of them are British drills, not quite all of them. Um, Tatey Tackle, we don't, have, we don't have anything that's got a certain German manufacturer's name on it, which upsets my German manufacturer's rep. Quite a bit, really. But Tong, Standen, Haith, that's probably the majority of it. Ridges of Jones. We've a, we a Rika D stoner and a Standen D stoner. Planters Standen, tillers are both Standen. Graders, Tom, swift lift elevators. All the backups on our shorts. You know, most of the manufacturers are in Lincolnshire or not far away. If we need some parts, I get out of bed in the morning. I've got parts back in yard before they time. Yeah. We don't have to wait for them coming on an aeroplane from Germany. It, it sort of makes sense in my head. Look after the manufacturers on your doorstep and they might still be there tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Schaefer sprayer, Austin fur applicator. <laughs> We're quite a, a CTM beat cleaner. Beat, beat harvesting is, is one of the few jobs that contractors do. We sort of occasionally get a bit of muck spreading done by a contractor if it clashes with planting taters or something like that. Most of the time we lay it spreaders and do it ourselves. You plant your own beet? Yeah, we, 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 we don't harvest our own beet, but we drill it. It's because it's, you know, we, there's a lot of beet comes out of the ground fast with a six row harvest. Uh, I haven't the, that much of an appetite for beet, and to go buy in a end of line six row beet harvest until no. a 50 acre beet, doesn't make no. sense. But we have a good, a good contractor on our doorstep, so it, it makes more sense to work with him. 
Yeah, you cut edges, bail straw. Do it all. Pretty much do it all, yeah. Maybe I'm, I'm uh, stubborn and untrusting of contractors, I don't know really, but I quite enjoy doing it myself. You know, we come back to scale again, really. You know, do you want to be a, a people manager or do you want to be a farmer? Well, granted, the biggest reason I'm drilling today is because my drill operator is out enjoying himself in New Zealand, scratching the travelling itch. And he'd only been gone about three days before we started missing him. It's, uh, I must have trained him right. <laughs> Let's just have the couples back. But this is his tractor. It's the only one we have with a, with a, with a carpeted fly. And that, we've had it for nearly a year. It's the first time I've driven it last week. I hope your boots are clean. Uh, ish. I took him a There's a brush here. I'll yeah, give, I'll yeah, give yeah, it a brush we'll out. I gave it a sweep out and sent him a picture just to show that I was looking after it in case he was worried. Those that know me would know that I would have a bit of carpet as well if I was driving a tractor again every day. Oh, that's, that's good. I'm a, I'm a bit particular. Oh, you weren't one of them leave the shoes at the door, were you? No, I didn't go as far as that. Oh, good. No. But I did make sure they were fairly clean when I got in. Yeah, well, my, mine varies a bit. It's not quite as clean as this. It's in carpet, it isn't mine. But... Dirty, dirty windows were my pet hate. Yes. Not, not being able to see out of a window. There we are. <laughs> Cleaning. It doesn't Cleaning have a lot kit. of exercise since Digby went away, I must say. But it might get a bit of exercise before he comes back. <laughs> you know, folks say about the young lads these days don't want work and you can't find staff. Staff is, get, is bad to get, very true. Uh, Digby started as a 15 year old Saturday boy that could work a power washer, but he couldn't back a tractor up yard. He didn't know which way to turn the steering wheel. And in the space of a couple of years, he's drilling and combining. I don't think an odd job or two he hasn't tried yet. There isn't many. Well, I've got to say, having seen him in action in the summer, he, um, he's a, you find himself a good one, there. Right? Yeah, he's uh, confident and keen. He's, he's gained enough confidence and skills to disappear off the other side of the bombing world. It's, uh, yeah, well, I've had too good a, good a job of it, maybe, I don't know. But. Although, another one in our, our team is a, an ex Royal Marine. He's had uh, six or seven years in Marines. Been driving a pig wagon for a few years. Desperate to have a go at farming. Nobody let me have a go because he didn't have any experience. Well, how are you going to get experience if nobody will let you have any? It's a bit of a, a vicious circle. Anyway, he's, his attitude and his enthusiasm and his ability to learn is absolutely first class. I mean, absolutely first class. You know, when you drive a pig wagon, you get used to a bit of clout and you get learned how to get out of bed in the morning, don't you? Yeah. I dare say if you don't get out of bed as a marine, someone will be chewing your ears off pretty quick. So there's a few boxes ticked there and if, if they've got the right attitude and approach, you can, all the rest of it's easy to teach. But somebody that wants to learn is very easy to teach and very, very rewarding to teach. Well, if, he's yeah. driven, if he's driven trucks, at least he's got half an idea about the scale of stuff. Oh yeah, the um, weight on wheels isn't really yeah. a problem. And I mean, I mean, seen him at the side of the harvester a little bit earlier. You didn't uh, see him his first time upside the harvester uh, when he first dropped elevator into trailer. <laughs> <laughs> when, when he got upside at combine and I, I put the tipping spout in gear and it come, corn comes pouring out of that spout quite quick when you're not used to it. That was a little bit scary. What for you or him? Both. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, it's, uh, sometimes it's a little bit get spilt in the process of learning, but I don't yeah. think you or I were any different on no, that front. absolutely not, mate. It's my mate years of hurt for making a mess in my time. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. I, set, I set off with a Ford 5.6 and an 8 ton scaling trailer upside of a class matador. It wasn't coming out of the spout quite as quick. <laughs> but you had to get out at way because spout was lower than top and camp. Yes. And if you got that wrong, you got you learnt some new words from me dad. <laughs> I don't think there's anybody that's been up the side of a tighter after it's never never caught the, caught the elevator. Uh, no, no, I have to confess I, I am guilty of that on me over the years. Yeah. I don't lead as many taters as I once did, but when you're when you're still at school and you're on a, on a weekend, I was filling man, I used to fill all the trailers in the field and somebody else brought them home and my dad tipped them. That was absolute gold was that. There's no no riddling we used to call it back then. No yeah. no riddling to do. Stay on a tractor all day. Yeah. Oh paradise. Absolutely. 135 with a four ton scale in trailer and I had to stand up to see into that. <laughs> it was a bit air raising riding on top of the load coming down, down that big hill into the village. <laughs> it's drum brakes on a 135 weren't that good when they were new. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't that good when there was nothing on the back. No, four ton <laughs> tater's pushing here, yeah, got a bit air raising. 
We're now sat on top of a trailer because that's how you travel. How you travel by then? No passenger seat in a one three five, is there? No. Nope. Get on top of the load. There's a little bit of room in that corner. Just hang on tight. <laughs> you'll be all right. Yeah. Somehow I managed to survive to tell the tale. Yeah. Hey, the old regen thing. We've we're not hardcore direct drilling. Initially, I thought really, but you know, the curiosity got the better of me. We mix two varieties together in that good old mixer I was talking about earlier. And hang on a minute, this is best yielding wheat we've got. <laughs> is this coincidence or what? Well, we'll save a bit of that seed with a, a very random collection of, of old trailers that we chuck seed in to the amusement of anybody that sees them. They're in pairs. There's two, well, there's only one trifit in a minute, but there's two ties and there's two scalings. <laughs> And they, they all do a job. It's just handy for keeping putting four or five tonne of a different variety or whatever. So we kept some of this mixed variety seed, thinking it can't possibly work a second year. It was obviously just a fluke or something. And oh, look, the following year, it's the best yielding variety again. Where they've been mixed together, not by a huge amount, but always best performer. So well, what happens if we, I did a bit of learning? That's where, that's where discussion comes from, the likes at Forum and reading other people's articles in press and that sort of thing about the importance of not having like, grand, like parents and like grandparents it takes a bit of research does that to work out which varieties to mix and which not you know, should you be complementary and uh, pick two different strains and if, if they're both strong they'll get to be stronger together or do you just pick the strong the, the, high, the best disease resistance if you like and the highest shield and hope you get the two ice box. Uh, and I was thinking, I was overthinking it in terms of maturity time, all that doesn't seem to make any difference. Well, that, that's proved to have worth doing, is that? I'm not quite so convinced by mixing seven or eight varieties or whatever, but certainly mixing two together has worked really well for us. But you, you do write in a couple of journals, don't you? I do. Those don't all get edited out. Some of it gets printed. <laughs> and would that be? That's I've seen you do some uh, some around the potato, one of the potato magazines. Actually. Yeah, ones where it's, is that uh, CPM you do potatoes. Uh, CPM. The, the column is called Talking Taters. Yeah. When I first started writing, I think the, the editor thought I was Scottish. Cause <laughs> you have tatties in Scotland, and taters <laughs> in Yorkshire. Come on, keep up. Um, and occasionally, uh, I can be controversial. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't believe that <laughs> for a minute. Always honest. Occasionally I can poke the bear, particularly if it's the, the corporate bear that's giving me a load of grief. I can be uh, express grumpiness. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, we don't have to pacify any advertisers or anything like that. It, it, it is an opinion column. And it's important to remember that it is an opinion column in much the same way that you write on a forum. It's an opinion yeah, forum. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's an opinion. Uh, and it forms a similar thing. And sometimes there's a focus on a say seasonal aspect or something like that yeah most recently it was the 25 year thing where we were asked to consider farming 25 years down the line which look at the last 25 years and you think 25 years ago 1985 it's not it's 1999 blimey charlie where the hell's all that gone yeah it's uh i get you get your crystal ball out because yeah. fill your boots really because nobody really knows for sure no. what we do know is that people are still gonna have to eat Farming will still be around. You know, when I was a kid at school, that bell used to take forever to ring. And then the teenage years got past in a bit of a blur, and 20s went past in a blur of beer drinking, tractor driving, and woman chasing. Or at least that's what I like to think. The truth isn't quite so glamorous. <laughs> There's a lot of tractor driving in it. <laughs> yeah, there was, yeah. Driving, a there lot was of beer a lot of tractor driving. Yeah, you can vote right, right there. <laughs> and, uh, Thirties <coughs> and family and responsibility and everything, and suddenly twenty or twenty years has gone yeah. past. And where's the next twenty going to yeah. take us? Even if even if we do get rid of all the livestock, we still have to grow something to eat off. We are, and you look at farms <laughs> round about that. There's a lot of dairy farming packed up in nineties and things like that. A lot of livestock disappeared, and farms got amalgamated. And now they're trying to buy muck in. Yeah. Well, the farms that that we harvest on, those that have, have seen regular muck consistently better crops, particularly in a dry time. Land, land is in better half for being looked after. Well, that's not rocket science, is it? It's, yeah. uh, I pointed out in my little column that it's not everybody's cup of tea in having a lot of livestock. Not everybody's got the appetite for it or the skills or the infrastructure or whatever. 
so muck is is still there. You know, for all the anti-animal brigade would really rather there was no animals. They don't. They can't seem to be able to join the door. So no animals means no muck. No. We get the door when the was fertilised. I'm not quite sure where food's going to come from. We've got to feed plants with something. Absolutely. You know, we have B&B pigs in straw yards, and we have had since 1990. It's not. It's nothing new to us. It's become quite fashionable in the last five or ten years. But that cool mixed farming. Yeah, 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 that's basically what it is. Yeah, it's, it's proper mixed farming. Yeah. That, that, the whole regen thing is mixed farming. Yeah, we're not we're not reinventing the wheel. No. We just, as my dad would call it, farming properly. Just, just so if, I, if I told him I was into regenerative farming, he'd think I'd been drinking. <laughs> I talk about him as if he's still here, but he's not. He's, he's, he, uh, he lost him in 2018. And one of his uh, we're, we're various chats in his latter days, as you do in such an occasion. He's a well hard lad, you're gonna to have to find somebody else to bounce your daft ideas off now because I'm not gonna be here much longer. <laughs> so that told me you can pacify me for a bit. He says, but I suppose I can't complain that much because if you change out, you generally do it for the right reasons. And I'll, I'll remove the adjectives. <laughs> but if you mess it up, you generally learn from it. So I suppose that'll do. Well, that was as near to the compliment as I was gonna get, but <laughs> on, I'll the, on his deathbed. I'll take that for you though. He, 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 he wouldn't have had more than a week left at that point in time. Oh, well, I'll take that. <laughs> he was mostly right, to be fair. Yes, some of my ideas are a little bit daft and what on earth was I thinking of. But occasionally one works. That keeps life interesting, doesn't it? Absolutely. If we were still ploughing and powering everything to death and drilling wheat, barley and rape, I would probably be quite disillusioned with the whole job. But there's a, and I'm still very sceptical of a lot of these Minority crops, they're like get rich quick schemes that never seem to quite deliver. Yeah. Partly because it's, it's hassle fact too, we dry corn for the people, you know, the physical aspects of it come into it. A small volume of a, a different crops and nuisance to us, really. We've got oats, beans, potatoes, and sugar beet. We don't really need any more of them. Break crops, really, so. No. But different ways of doing the same thing. They're, they're very plentiful. Yeah. You know, but look at a few YouTube farmers for different ways of how they do things. and scale invariably plays, in a, plays a part in that too, but in different parts of the country. It's very know, yeah, in different parts of the country, some things do work differently, don't they? Apparently it rains in Cambridgeshire and Bedfordshire. Apparently so. <laughs> Quite a bit in Bedfordshire. <laughs> who thought, who, who knew? We always thought south was dry. It was yeah. a poor sod in the north that caught all yeah. rain. But, you know, Ireland seems to get its share of rain every year. And uh, my wife, my uh, Red Rose pals in, in Lancashire, they take great delight in telling me how much more rain they get and still seem to manage on their boys' land that drains straight through. That's well, the well, best thing about the Pennines, isn't it? It keeps it away from here. Exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's exactly what the Pennines were designed for. Keep them all at that side of the hill. <laughs> if you're watching, Mr. Webster. <laughs> it's, well, uh, it's, all, it's all good fun. One of yeah. the other things you're heavily involved in is the um, Agriculture Society. I am, yeah. Well, I'm a future farmer. Yeah, future farming. Yeah, I'm. A, I'm a, I suppose I'm a founder member. There was 30 of us when we first started that off in way back in 2010. I think it was sort of became a bit more proper. There was a bit happening before that on a very fringe level with a few young farmers that I got to all for young farmers. A lot, a lot of us at Hill County offices. There was some young some some vets of a similar age, so late 20s, early 30s, and there was quite a bit of skill between us of one side or another that we'd gathered up through holding office, and it seemed a, a shame not to make something social of it, really, and Future Farmers was born. Yeah. Back then there was 30 of us when it sort of first kicked off properly, and now there's over a 1,000 members. It's huge, isn't it? Yeah, it is, it's good. And there's some, some great meetings, some great events that they put on. Yeah, you, can, you can learn. a couple of them. It's, yeah, uh, you, you can learn all sorts on that from stuff about farm accounts and succession and you name it, it'll get talked about if yeah. there's an appetite for it. Yeah. No, it's great. It's, um, I think Yorkshire Agricultural Society, I mean, I know I've lived here for 18 years, so I'm not quite native, but I'm, and I never will be because I was never born here, so don't start. <laughs> um, I said, you know, an, an agronomist of years ago asked me, asked me a question when he was brought, he was brought up in, in South London. He says, how long do you have to live in Yorkshire before you come to the Yorkshire? <laughs> I said, it's 50 years, John, I'll be born here, straight off the bat. <laughs> Good yell, he said, I thought I'd made it, I've been here 30 years. <laughs> Another 20, you'll be there, won't you? Well, it's, uh, I think it's longer if you're, from, if you're born in Lancashire, though. Oh, is that? Oh, yeah, okay, it is, right. yeah. But I think as, a, as a, an agricultural society, I think Yorkshire, actually, it's, um, there's always a lot going on. There is. 
Uh, it's a big, big old county. It's a very, it's a very, to give it a modern term, it's a very diverse county. It's a hu yeah, hugely diverse you know, county. Uh, my, my, my wife was, grew up in the west side of Huddersfield, dairy farmer's daughter. A bit hilly over there, isn't it? Yeah, it is a bit. A yeah. bit, bit different from this sort of Very, scene, very right? different to a quiet North Yorkshire lad, really. Yeah. What struck me is that you're never more than five minutes from either the most intense city centre or the most bleak moor top. There's just not much in between. No. And the houses just get less. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh... But it is, it's an incredibly diverse county, isn't it? You know, the, uh, and it's one of the things I've, I've always liked about it. I've always had a, quite a thing for the Wolds and North Yorkshire and the western side as it gets more more livestock more grass mm -hmm. is it equally as uh, nice isn't it oh yeah 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 there's, there's a there's a full spectrum of the, the wide arable fields of yorkshire walls to the heather and moors and sheep on yeah. on, the, on the moors and the more industrial nature of west yorkshire it's you know, a bit of wide spectrum very, you very go anywhere wide. else you like in the world but you come over that hill top and look into this valley and why do you want to live anywhere else really no. I'm slightly biased, I've lived there all my life. <laughs> it's, it's a beautiful part of the world, I've got to say. Oh yeah. All right, um, thank you for, uh, for inviting me out to see you. Pleasure. No problem at all. It's been great to see you. Um, I'll have to come and have a talk about the, your, your pig enterprise and uh, hopefully you get well, the rest of your taters. We, we, have a, we have planning permission to put another pig shed up, so I just need to get on and get it built now. Well, there's your winter project. <laughs> I have enough winter projects. It's how well, I I've well, seen your winter project. You need to give away from your, yeah, your auctions, the machinery auctions. That's, that's what you need to do. Stop, tell the wife. <laughs> she calls them my retirement projects, oh, and thankfully oh. she doesn't know me there is. <laughs> it's uh, <coughs> always something to do, isn't there? It's, Absolutely. Uh, Brilliant. Well, great to see you. I'll see you again soon. No problem.